Good morning. This is Lions Den and I'm Maureen Lyons. Today Katie Rydell and Michael Parent will tell us in song and story the history of the textile industry, the people who built it, and in particular the women workers. Um, Katie, <coughs> excuse me, has a master's degree in folklore from UCLA. At Cal State, she taught teachers how to use storytelling in the classroom. As well as being a storyteller, she's a musician, author, workshop leader, and performer. And in Maine, she's traveled around the state for the Arts Our Elementary program using puppets and Japanese storytelling cards. Michael Parent grew up in Lewiston in a French-Canadian mill-working family and much of his work <clears throat> has been influenced by that upbringing. He's been an advocate of French American culture and taken his bilingual performances to different countries. He's done one-man shows, story writing, and performance workshops. He's an author, songwriter, and musician who now lives in Portland. How did you two come up with this program for today? has to do more with Katie's interest in the mills and my, um, you know, I, I've been messing around with that for quite a long time. So when she told me of her interest in the mills, I thought, hey, I'd like to be part of this. This is actually a project that grew out of my work in graduate school. When I was working on a degree in folklore, I got introduced to women's occupational songs, and I had mm. never heard of such a thing. I knew there were songs about men working, men uh, working on the railroad, cowboy songs, sea chanties, but I had no idea that there were, uh, that there was this huge treasure trove of songs about women working. And um, because so many women worked in the textile industry, I focused a lot on that, and I found that I couldn't understand the songs without understanding the history and the, the history. development of all these machines and how they got developed and how they moved geographically and that's how it all started. Did the women write the songs or did men write the songs and women sang them? Oh, I, I think it's very hard to answer that question. Um, these songs weren't written down until kind of often long after their heyday. Um, often <coughs> they were recorded from the mouths of women, so women knew the songs, but um, I expect men were allowed to sing them too. Why not? But as far as who made them up, I think the verses in some of these songs would indicate <coughs> that the women came up with them first, yeah. hmm. as you will see when we sing a couple of them. Um, tell me what your professional life in Maine, because you're from California and you moved to Portland, what is your professional life like in Portland? Different. <laughs> Tell me. <laughs> in California, um, uh, I worked, uh, it, it, was just, it was just different. I worked a lot with taiko drummers. And even though we have a taiko drumming troupe here in Portland, I don't do as much work with them. Taiko drums are the big, Big Japanese drums, um, uh, the biggest drum in Portland, just big, big baby like this. Wow. Big Bertha, it's wonderful. Um, and I, I've, I've been interested in melding music and storytelling for a long time, and so um, I'm very interested in telling the Japanese folk tales with the Japanese drumming. So that, that was something I did more of in California. Um, and Michael? Uh, I would say that uh, I lived in Virginia for quite a while, mm -hmm. and uh, ironically enough, that's when I discovered the uniqueness of my Franco-American upbringing. Uh, I would come back home and I would record these songs that my aunts and uncles knew, and then I'd listen to them talk and realize that the way they talked was completely unique. 
And uh, so when I moved back to Maine, and I've kept my French up fairly well. Um, I've done performances in French. I, I think there were more opportunities here uh, for that kind of thing, since there are more French-speaking people. Mm -hmm. uh, when I, I, I've done programs in Biddeford, and I've been quite astonished to see how many people relate to the mill thing and to the French thing and, you yeah. know, moving from Quebec to Maine and all. So I, uh, although things are slowing down quite a bit now, I think that moving from Virginia to Maine uh, tuned me into not only my family but the bilingual work and uh, the, especially the mill stuff. Well, there is a mill museum to, that will be opened in the spring. Um, mm -hmm. It'll have photos and history and different families who work there and the machinery, but that's a, a, a big interest again. Mm -hmm. So when that opens, that'll be uh, continuing the history of, of Biddeford. Mm -hmm. and, and Lowell the has a, such a museum yeah. and mm -hmm. uh, Lawrence. Lewiston. Uh, quite a few of these mill towns have. Yeah. Yeah. Manchester. Manchester has a... Yeah, a, yeah I want to go there. Yeah. Tell me about the instruments. We know the guitar. Yes, <laughs> this is a parlor guitar. <laughs> and it used to be actually, you know, this, this seems like just any old guitar, but they used to, it's called a parlor guitar because it was hung on the wall and any time anybody just wanted to play a song, play. Uh, since they're fairly small guitars, they didn't take up a lot of room, so somebody would just take it off the wall and play a tune. But uh, Katie's instruments are very unique. <laughs> this is a ukulele. Go ahead, ask me what color it is. Uh, what color is it? Eucalyptus. Oh, no. I, oh, I, I, God. I did, I did well, not. Well, it is green. Right. <laughs> I did not come up with that name. The manufacturer came up with that name. And um, it, it's... Um, Marketed Ooh. by Flea Market Music, Flea and Market Music. Um, all, it comes in many different colors. And I was in the shop, kind of holding up each color, asking people, "Well, which color <laughs> should I wear? <laughs> should I wear?" <laughs> and um, I was told I should get the eucalyptus one because it made me laugh every time I said that, which it still does. <laughs> Is it Hawaiian? There you go. It's, a, you ha it's a Hawaiian instrument, and I play it because it's only got four strings, and it's pretty easy. Um, and, and it stands other. on its own. This is, yeah. not, this is not something to be sneezed at. Look <laughs> at that. That stands on its own. <laughs> Try to stand this on its own. It doesn't work. That works. And this is a dulcimer, an Appalachian dulcimer. Um, usually has four strings, but I took one of the strings off because it got in my way when I wanted to pluck it with my fingers. And it's a traditional do that. instrument from uh, the Appalachian Mountains. Okay. All right, the history of the Industrial Revolution in song and story. <laughs> yeah, Gee, that because, sounds good. Because that's what it's all about. When I first started looking at these songs and their history, I, I, I saw two things. Um, one is that there's a geographic movement that the oldest songs come from Great Britain you know, where, the, where the textile industry first developed its spinning and weaving machines. And then as New England developed the industry, the songs move across the Atlantic. And then as the New England textile industry began to collapse and the industry got song stronger in the South, the songs moved to the South. So there's this whole geographic movement across the Atlantic and from the Northeast hmm. to the South. Hmm. But accompanying that movement, is a really interesting emotional movement in the songs because the oldest songs that I've found have um, this playful love element to it. Sometimes they're, they're takeoff on romantic, erotic love, but other times they're just uh, songs with an element of affection for the machinery. And it's only after the Industrial Revolution gets kind of rocking and rolling and working becomes not so much fun, maybe as it was at the beginning, that a certain element of disaffection comes in and people aren't singing about their work with as much affection. And by the time the industry moves south in the 20th century, um, people are so emotionally unattached to their work that they're singing about the work, but, th but there's not 
there's not affection in, in their words, and there's, the words are not necessarily industry specific. I mean, the, ear the earliest songs, you really need a dictionary to understand what the people are talking about because the language mm. is so intertwined with the machinery. The 20th century songs um, are much more distant from the textile industry, um, and they're really kind of talking about the work situa situation in general uh, and appealing to, to the growing labor movement as opposed to being specific to one industry. So they're kind of very different. Anyway, um, back in England, they s the, whole, the whole thing is about, you know, where do you get the clothes you wear? And it's all about, you know, taking either a hank of wool from a sheep or a ball of cotton from a plant and taking those fibers and spinning them out so they're long and thin and then weaving them together so you can make your clothes. Um, and in the 18th century, machines started to be developed that would speed up that process of weaving each individual thread because that was a long, tedious process yeah. when you had to spin each thread by hand. And so um, you got uh, a kind of competition between which machines were going to be developed first, the spinning or the weaving, and they kind of went back and forth who was ahead. Um, they, the spinning jenny got developed, and then uh, a water frame that would spin more than one thread at a time, and then this contraption, which was called a mule, because it just as the mule animal is a cross between a horse and a donkey, and it's a hard, you, what you get is a hard worker, the spinning mule is a cross between the spinning jenny and Arkwright's water frame, and what you get is this machine that has you know hundreds of spindles all going. <laughs> And yeah, they were amazing. Out lots of thread. And guess where the last working spinning mule in North America is? Oh. Biddeford. Nope. No. Close, though. It's Lewis? in Maine. It's Lewiston? in Lewiston? Nope. Nope. Um. Sanford. Nope. Oh. Give up. Give up. Saco. Nope. 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 But it's in Maine. It's in Maine. It's in Harmony, Maine. Oh. Bartlett Yarns. It's a wool spinning mill, and it's got the last working. It's still it's in still operation? Working, and it's a wonder. You walk in the room, and <gasps> you're back in the 19th century. Wow. It's just amazing. The machine was actually built in 1948, but it's using the technology from the 18th century. Hmm. And it's just, it's just fabulous to hmm. see it. Hmm. Um, Okay, so America was watching this uh, industrial development take place in England, but America really didn't want that here because America looked at the squalor of English cities and the impoverished and uneducated population that was working in the mills, and America was you know, still young and still trying to develop a democracy, and you can't have a democracy if most of your people are poor and uneducated. So America said, no, 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 no. We don't want that kind of industrial development here. But along came Napoleon. You didn't know he was part of this story, right? Everything The Industrial Revolution and Napoleon? No. Everything's <laughs> connected to everything. The whole Napoleonic wars that were ravaging Europe messed up transatlantic trade. And so goods couldn't travel back and forth across the Atlantic. America decided, hmm, I guess we need to have the industry here as well. Well, that was all very well and good, but how were we going to get it? Britain had a monopoly. Britain wanted to keep a monopoly. And if you knew how to build one of these spinning or weaving machines, you were not allowed to emigrate. You were not allowed near a port. Wow. No, seriously, one of the artisans got on a ship. He was on his way to America. The British came out, stopped the ship, searched it till they found him, and took him off. Took him right back, yeah. Mm. Surprising. But along came, well, uh, first there was Samuel Slater, who was the superintendent of one of the mills. And I guess they thought, well, what does a superintendent know? He just sits at a desk around. all day. But he walked around, and he knew enough so that he was allowed to emigrate, and he established Slater's Mill in Pawtucket, 
Rhode Island, and that was our first spinning mill, but we still didn't have weaving. And along came Francis Cabot Lowell, who went to England and in uh, what is a brilliant feat of industrial espionage, he smuggled mm -hmm. out what he needed to know to build the machines. And his luggage was actually searched twice before they let him out, the, out of the country, but they couldn't find where he had hidden the information because he hid it in a really sneaky place. He That's ate his it. Head, yeah. In <laughs> his head, he ate it. <laughs> no. Wow. <laughs> no, he hid what it in guy. his head. So um, <laughs> he brought back the information that was needed to set up a factory in which you could spin and weave the cloth, spin the thread and weave the cloth all in one building, all in one building. And when uh, America realized it had that information, it wanted to build a lot of factories, and that was done and in the community now known as Lowell, Lowell Massachusetts. Mass. The first mill there was built in 19, 23. By 1933, there were five, there were 19 five-story mills in Lowell that employed 5,000 mill workers, most of whom were women. Mm. And the reason they employed women was because there was nobody else. The machinery was way too complicated to put children to work on it. And at that time in our history, it was still fairly easy for a man to get a farm. And so the only labor force available was young women, the daughters of Yankee farmers. Now, in order to induce the farmers to let their daughters go off to the big bad city and work, the mill owners had to offer nice living conditions and supervision. And so you got the boarding, boarding house, house system. Mm -hmm. um, so the boarding houses went up in, in Lowell. And th when um, this operation was seen to be so successful in Lowell, of course, other communities copied it, mm -hmm. including Biddeford. And so Biddeford got its first mills in the 1840s and a row of boarding houses to go with it. But the first big boarding house town was Lowell, so. Let's do Lowell Factory Girls. All right. Da -da 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 -da. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Start with the wrong instrument. Oops. <clears throat> Here. Thank, Thank you. Here's the one that stands on its own. <laughs> <laughs> No more I'll scar my dirty floor 
all in the weaving room. Soon you'll see me married to a handsome little man. Then I'll say to you factory girls, see me when you can. Hit re ori ori o, hit re ori a, hit re ori ori o, hit re ori a, hit re ori ori o, hit re ori a, hit re ori. Don't know. The Lowell Factory Girls. The actual um, song was first printed in 1830, and it's 18 verses long. We didn't sing all the verses. <laughs> but but the, the song is so grounded in the life of the factory. I mean, it talks mm -hmm. about, oh, now I am in Lowell, summoned by the bell. The factory bell dominated your life. And if you were not inside the factory gate, when the bell stopped tolling and the gate shut, your pay was docked 12 and a half cents. Now, if you were working 70 hours a week and being paid $2.35 for that entire <laughs> stint, if your pay was docked 12 and a half cents, that's the equivalent of, of losing four and, a, four and a half hours of work. So the factory bell was really important. Um, the Dress Room Girls, uh, that verse, I love that verse because it, it, the mills at that time in the 19, 1830s were five stories high, bottom floor for the waterworks and then the carding room and then the spinning and then the weaving and the Dress Room Girls, the ones who finished the cloth, were on the top floor. Um, but the verse that, that I think is the killer verse is, is the verse where people are expressing their admiration for this machinery. It is a wonder how the men. men can such machinery make a thousand wheels together roll without the least mm. mistake. I mean, who sings about their work like that now? <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Not me. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, the industry changed over time. Um, Different people came to work in the mills. Uh, the Irish famine drove people out of Ireland. They came here to work. And because they were Irish in this country, before the famine, many of the Irish who came went to stay with family. And so they didn't need the, the boarding houses. And so that system began to fall apart. And then other immigrants came from elsewhere, from from Quebec? From Quebec, from across the border. Um, Biddeford's first Franco-American, Israel Chevenel, came to Ever work. That name? Came to work in the in the brick making factory in the brickworks and uh, came here, waded here through 18 inches of spring mud. I mean that image. Is t you had to really want to be here <laughs> to go <laughs> through that mud. But anyway, as, as the industry developed um, and uh, the capitalism kind of dug its teeth into the factories and how do you get more money out of fewer laborers, working became less pleasant, strikes became more common, and in the early uh, 20th century, uh, the industry began to move south to get away from the labor unions in the north. There were other reasons, too. Um, the switch from water power to coal. Coal was cheaper and more accessible in the south. Um, the factories were closer to the cotton fields in the south. So, so um, the factories moved, and the songs moved, and became um, kind of different. Mm -hmm. not, not so full of affection for work. This is a song from, uh, I think, the 20s or 30s from the South. 
called Cotton Mill Girls. Definitely an old timey sound. Yeah. Oh, well, I have a family story about um, when it wasn't so great to uh, work in the mills. Uh, and, and part of this story is true, actually, and part of it, the last part, I um, added a bit of history into the story for uh, a show that I did called One More Thing, <coughs> where I portrayed this uh, old retired mill worker. And um, so the story goes like this. Ah, yeah. Got to have a drink, huh? Tabal Mush. Mm. So, I got five kids, and uh, my daughter, Irene, you know Irene, huh? Yeah. She's smart. She teaches at the university something called women's studies. I wish I would understand women as well as she does. Anyway, so, uh, her mother died, and she wanted to hear all the old stories. And all the old songs. Un crapaud pris dans la glace, pas capable, pas capable de se décrocher. We used to sing that when the kids went to sleep. It's about a toad stuck in the ice. He couldn't get away. We sing it over and over again. The poor kids. <laughs> they may, maybe they went to sleep out of self-defense. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, so Irene, my oldest daughter, she wants to hear all the old stories. I said, okay. I went and talked to my wife at the cemetery, and she told me, tell the kids all the stories they want to hear. So there's this one about Manon Francois. See, he came from Quebec to work in the mills, and we already had some family down here anyway. So he comes down to work in the mills, but he got no money. He wanted to come down. He had uh, 10, 11 kids. You know, we had uh, us uh, French Canadian Catholics. We had the rhythm method, and... Uh, well, later we had bingo, and uh, if the rhythm method didn't work, bingo. <laughs> anyway, so uh, he wanted to come down to the States to work in the mills. You know, uh, he heard that you can make more money in one year than you can lose on your farm in five years. So, but he didn't know what he was going to do, but he was debouillard, that guy. That means somebody that can unfog themselves, huh? So what did he do? He had enough money for one ticket on the train from this little village he lived in in Quebec. And he had enough money to go to the next station, uh, oh, about 16 miles down the, down the track. So he brings with him on the train some bread, 
some ham and some mustard. And while the train's rolling along, he makes some ham sandwiches. And he sells them to the people on the train. Uh, madame, voulez-vous un bon sandwich au jambon? Hey, madame, hey, wait, wait. Oh, wait, c'est bon. Oh, wait. So, he does this until he gets to the first stop that his ticket was good for. He gets there, and he's got enough money to buy another ticket for the next place, and maybe enough to buy some, some bread, some ham, some mustard. So he's making them, they're selling them, the train's rolling along. Took him seven days to get to the United States of America. Les Etats-Unis, as we used to call it. And uh, he got there, he worked for one year, double shift. You could do that in those days. He worked from seven to three, first shift, three to 11, second shift. He'd go to uh, his cousin's house or somebody, sleep, send some money home to his wife and kids. And after one year of working double shift, he moved his whole family down to the United States. Hmm. He wanted to come to the States. He figured it out, and he did it. That's what you call a debrouillard. Well, anyway, there was another part of the story. Irene, my daughter, she wants to hear the whole story. So I told her. <sighs> Mon nom Francois, he worked in the mill. He was a hard worker. He worked his way up to loom fixer. That's a big job in the mill, huh? And he got his hand caught in some machinery. He lost three fingers. Well, of course, he lost his job. And then he tried to take the mill owners to court because they wouldn't give him no, uh, what you call, workman's compensation now. They didn't have that at the time, but he wanted them to help him pay his hospital expense and everything. No deal. What the mill did, they hired a bunch of uh, their fancy lawyers, and he lost the case. Well, he hit the bottle pretty soon, and everything went into the ditch from there. Ah, well, anyway, it turns out to be kind of a sad story, but, you know, my kids, they, they want to hear the stories about where they came from and everything. And my wife at the cemetery, I know it sounds a little funny, and the guys down at the, the Naughty Pine, when I tell them these stories about talking to my wife in the cemetery, they look at me kind of funny, you know. I don't care. The hell with them. Anyway, so, that's the story that Irene wants to hear all the time. So, it wasn't all that much fun working the mill, you know. That's the end of that. So that's a story, and, and most of that story is true. I had a, an uncle that moved down to the States, and that's how he got here. Uh, the part about his losing three fingers and the, um, the lack of compensation was something that I found out at the archive in Lewis and Maine. It turned out that for years, for a long period of time, maybe 50 or 60 years, not one cent was paid out for injury, injury. compensation in the, the Lewiston Mills because they'd hire lawyers and they'd find a way not to pay people for uh, mill-related injuries. And I guess they happened quite often. Uh, I mean, often enough, you know. And uh, so it was a matter of the bottom line, I guess. And um, So they were out of a job and... Out of a job and out of money. Yeah. And, and, well, the good thing was, I guess, that they had large supportive families mm -hmm. But everybody else was kind of struggling, too. You know, they lived in these tenements, maybe 10, 12 people living in one apartment. And so, and, and a lot of these people were pretty stubborn and, and didn't like to ask for help. So, anyway, that's just one story. And, and it turns out that in our family, Manon France did not have that experience of the three fingers getting chopped off by one of the machines. But in fact, quite a few people did. So I thought I'd throw that in for uh, um, some historic verisimilitude. How's that for a big word, huh? Ooh la la. <laughs> you, you have another little story that you tell about your family. They used to say, what they used to say would happen if all the machines ever got in sync. Oh, oh well, I've checked that out. <laughs> 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 well, you know, the, the, as, as you know, the looms really... Uh, create quite a beat. Mm -hmm. And um, my cousin Robert once told me that if all the machines in a mill 
ever got in sync and all beat at the same time. The world would end. That the building would fall apart. Because ah. there was so much power. But anyway, mm -hmm. uh, so I had the impression that the, somebody had to go around and make sure the machines were not in <laughs> sync. It turns out that the machines hardly ever got in sync. So it was, it was not really a problem. I, I checked this out with, uh, with Robert. Well, when we went on the tour of the Biddeford Mills, which everybody should do. Yeah, yeah so it's great. It was, it was Dana said that the, actually the, the machines used to get in sync every 15 minutes. Oh, is that right? <laughs> really? And no kidding. The building didn't fall down. Oh, <laughs> so much for that story. <laughs> but it's a great story. I can just see how people would think that, though, because those were big, powerful machines. Oh, yeah, and there were a whole, you know, as we talked about before, you could, if you stood on one end of the room, w there, there was a football field, a football field worth of machinery and all, all pumping and all very, very loud at the time. It must have been yeah. horrible to yeah. work. Yeah, and everyone in my family, as I told you earlier, uh, all the women in the family worked in the mills because my grandfather was an overseer. And so he, he thought it was a good idea for all the girls to work in the mills, and, and they did, um, except for one who left home uh, and became a beautician, my Aunt Lucille. But hmm. in any case, just about everyone, men and women in my family, in my father's generation and the generation before that, they worked in the mills because that's what, at the time, the mills were running 24 hours a day, six days a week. They must have had a lot of stories, you know, complaining stories or funny things. That, I mean, just all kinds of stuff happened during the day, during the week. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, in, in a way, the mill was also the social center of yeah. things. You know, so you, you'd walk to work with your friends. Uh, one of my aunts told me that working in the mill wasn't that bad because you got to walk to work with your friends. You'd find out where all the dances were going to be and, and where all the cute guys are going to be on Friday and Saturday night. <laughs> uh, you'd um, the mills and the churches were, you know, you'd see the same people in the mills mm -hmm. that you saw at your church. Uh, it was warm in the mill. I mean, they could overlook the fact. Uh, I mean, they would admit, I guess, that it was not only really, really wow. loud, but very dusty. But it was warm in the mill, and when you compare it to a Quebec winter. Mm -hmm. uh, so she had kind of a different take on it, which kind of surprised me, actually. Yeah, kind of surprised me. Anyway, so much for the mills machines being in sync <laughs> <laughs> and the buildings not, falling apart. Not bad luck after all. <laughs> <laughs> well, should we go back to New England for one more song? Yeah, if you want that to. That would be this one. Oh, Bitterford Factory Girls. <laughs> you mean that one? I mean that one. Oh, okay. I just, I just want to say a, a word about this song. This is a song that uh, was probably sung before the 1850s. And when these New England farm girls would go to Biddeford or Lowell or Manchester, wherever, to work, they'd often come from their farms with um, a shawl wrapped over their head. They didn't wear hats. They just had a shawl wrapped over their head. And they'd look at all the, the other factory girls who'd been there in the city for a while, and they were wearing bonnets. And so that was um, a, a mark of sophistication to wear a bonnet. So with mm. their first paycheck, often the girls would go out and buy a bonnet, which at that time was called a shaker. So in this song, you'll hear the girl singing about, no more will I take my shaker and shawl. And she's talking about putting on her hat, mm -hmm. and going off to work. Mm -hmm. I lived in Virginia for quite a while, and a friend handed me this song, which uh, comes from oh. the factory girls in Maine, Lewiston or Biddeford. Come all ye Biddeford factory girls, I want you to understand, I'm going to leave this factory and Return to my native land. Dundee, wickedy Dundee, Dundee, wickedy Dundee. No more will I take my shaker and shawl. Hurry to the mill. No more will I work so pissed. Earn a dollar bill. Dundee, wickedy, 
French translation of this song. However, we'll just do one verse. And here the girl says, I'm going to quit the factory, but I'm going back to Canada. So that's a kind of a tribute to the women in my family. Venez les filles du moulin, je veux vous dire quelque chose comme factory girls, I want to tell you something. Je vais quitter ce moulin-là, retourner au Canada. I'm going to quit that mill and go back to Canada. Dundee, wickedy, dundee, dundee, wickedy, dundee. Wonderful. Yay! You also wrote a book. Uh, it's a translation. Called Kings King and Ed Fools. Yeah, wasn't that about fam family Well, well uh, there's one story in Mill there that, that has to do with, with uh, my grandfather, actually, who was, to me, a kind of a king in the family. Uh, he, he was the guy who was the overseer in the mill, and he was the first Franco-American overseer in the Lewiston uh, textile mills. He worked in the rayon weaving room. Um, and But the book is mostly translated folk tales. Um, mm. uh, a friend of mine pointed out that uh, she was working on a book of uh, world folk tales and was having a hard time finding English translations of French or French Canadian folk tales. So a friend of mine and I, uh, a, a different friend, Julien Olivier, and I collected a bunch of stories that we liked, and we translated them into English. And August House Publishers, which was then in Arkansas, now in Atlanta, decided to put this together. So it's available on Amazon, I think. Uh, but it's mostly Franco-American or uh, folk tales from the North American French tradition. Hmm. Yeah. But uh, there's very little about the mills in there. I mean, there. I'm spo I suppose there are some stories that are somewhat parallel, but I wouldn't push that too far. Yeah, I was telling you earlier that <coughs> uh, there's, there's this week is a Franco-American forum about Franco-Americans assimilating in Maine. It's supposed to be on a rival show, MPBN, <laughs> on uh -huh. Thursday night. I heard. Um, so that will be interesting. Mm. Uh, you wrote a book as well. Tell me about The Wind Says Goodnight. It's a children's book. It's a, it's a children's book. It's a bedtime story. And it was, um, I was not then a resident of Maine. I was at that time somebody who came to Maine in summer like a smart person. <laughs> 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 but yeah, 
yeah. it's, the story is actually set set in Maine. I had Maine very much in mind when I was when I was writing it. Yeah. What's your connection to Maine? Um, kind of on, on my husband's family acquired a cottage on an island back in 1939. Hmm. Um, and so when I was married, I came every summer. Which island was it? It's Isle of Springs in the Booth Bay Harbor area oh. in the Sheepscot River. I've been there. Have you really? I've been in the river, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, that, that was my summertime connection. Nice. But then um, I have a cousin who moved here. Um, we, we both grew up in, on Long Island in New York State, but she moved to Brunswick um, because her husband was running the mill in um, oh, really? Harmony. In Harmony, yeah. For 25 years, my cousin ran Bartlett Mills. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, that's how Aren't I came we to see. Safe today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. So a lot of my family slid here over the years. I did too. <laughs> safe, as it's in baseball. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have anything else to add before we say goodbye? It's a really fascinating history, and there's a lot been it is, that, it is. that has been written about it. And uh, Katie actually knows more about it than I do, but I feel like there's a family connection. And every time I read something or learn something new about it, it uh, it gives uh, a person an idea of where they came from. And and as as a matter of fact, when you go down the main street of Biddeford and you see these huge, huge buildings, and you realize that. Not so long ago, maybe 50, 60 years ago, those were full of people working, and that was the, the lifeblood of the town, you know? Um, so I, I think it, historically, I, I don't know, I'm at an age where I, I'm appreciating history more right, or right. appreciating family things more, but I, I do believe that there's a, a very rich history connected with the textile mills and, yeah. and yeah. Towns like Bitterford, Lewiston, all these towns that we've named, Lowell, Manchester, Woonsocket, Rhode Island, where I lived for a while, uh, they have this very rich history and, and people who still remember. And work there. Yeah. I mean, yeah. in this town, the people yeah. who were working on this new yeah. museum, um, they work there. Uh, they're getting exhibits, you know, photographs from people, and they're going to yeah. have exhibits. And it, it should be a lot like... Lawrence and Lowell, and uh, hopefully popular. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I'm really glad that Biddeford is working on that. And in fact, I, I guess my parting message to the citizens of Biddeford is <laughs> stop what you're doing and go to the mill. <laughs> Probably have to wait till next summer, but Dan and Dana gave us a tour of the Biddeford Mills that was just mm. spectacular. Yeah, you, cannot, you cannot buy the kind of passion that they put into their mm. tour of the mill. Wonderful. Well, there will be ghost tours in January, I'm told. So if you'd like to go to them, they will be available soon. Yeah. Thank you. You've entertained and educated us, which is a great combination. So I thank you, Katie and Michael. You're welcome. And thank you, the audience, loyal audience. And Let's thanks. have a hand for our audience. Yay! Yay. <laughs> and thanks, Biddeford Public Access. I'm Maureen Lyons. This is Lion's Den. Thank you. Bye.